Hello, everybody. I'm Amit Stavinsky, the Managing Director of Tamar Securities and its affiliates, 911 Financial Services and Firefighters United. I wanted to reach out to all of you with our firm's third quarter economic projections. I will start with what I think is in the mind of every person in this country, and that is hyperinflation. The recent increase in prices of consumer price index came out at 8.3% year over year. What makes it worse is the food cost increase in prices of 11% year over year. This is the highest increase in prices since 1981. Inflation that should have been put to rest more than 40 years ago as a result of globalization and computer efficiency is now back in play. Therefore, we are also witnessing the highest increase in short-term Fed fund rates. Short-term rates this year are up 3.25% on route to 4.25% by the end of the year. In November, we will get most likely another 75 basis points increase in interest rates, which will follow in December by another 50 to 75 basis points increase. According to the Federal Reserve's summary of economic projections, they believe that this year short-term rates will end up at 4.4% and next year, same rates will be at 4.6%. That is putting a tremendous damper on the growth of the US economy. That slowdown and trajectory of higher interest rates brought about one of the worst stock market results so far this year. The average stock on the Nasdaq is down 51%. The average stock on the Russell 2000 is down 47%. The 75 fastest growing companies in America are down 62%. We are also living through one of the worst bear markets in global sovereign debt. This is the first bear market in bond market since 1949. In the US, this is the worst bear markets in bonds in the past 100 years, culminating with the Marshall Plan and the Treaty of Versailles after the last two world wars. To give you an example, the 30-year Treasury bond is down 29% this year, even worse than the decline of the emerging market bonds, which are down only 24% this year. It's pretty astonishing for the most widely used, deepest and most liquid markets in the world, and that is our treasury market, to be down in a year 29%. That leads me to the next question, are we in a recession? The answer by most pundits and the politicians is no. Our view is that we are in a recession. And this is why we went through so far two consecutive negative quarters of GDP growth rates. In the first quarter, our GDP contracted by 1.4%. In the second quarter, it was confirmed that our GDP contracted by 6 tenths of a percent. The yield curve is inverted. The two years treasury bond pays more than the 10 year treasury bond. And soon enough, the three months treasury bond will pay more than the 10 year treasury bond. Consumer sentiment is down. The difference between the present situation and the expectation index is negative. When that is at a negative number of north of 30, we are in a recession. Also, the Philadelphia Manufacturing Index is at its lowest since 1979, and jobless claims are spiking. Typically, when you have all these data points coming together in the past 45 years, it was confirmed that we are in a recession. So in my view, the only question is, is that a shallow recession or a deeper recession? In the event it is a deeper recession, there is more downside potential to the indexes. For example, a historical recessionary earnings per share of 15 times earnings. In the event, the average stock on the S&P 500 will earn $240 a share. It is not unlikely to assume that the S&P 500 can drop from 3,600 points to 3,300 points. And to make it more difficult, if earnings will keep going down to $200 a share at 14 to 15 times earnings, that means the S&P 500 could find the bottom at around 3,000 points. My message to all of you is that the markets in our view are already discounting hyperinflation and higher interest rates and geopolitical risks because markets discount the future.
That said, there are a few more bars to clear, such as negative earnings revisions with the announcements of the third quarter reporting season, such as another 75 basis points increase in Fed fund rates in November, followed by another in December, the midterm elections, and inflation numbers side by side with job reports that will come out in October and in November. But not all is lost. I will share with you a few data points that make us extremely enthusiastic and opportunistic about the next 12 to 18 months. For example, since 1998, when 30% of stocks in the Nasdaq Composite Index closed at a 52-week low in one day, 17 out of 17 times, 12 months later, the median stock was up 57%. And what followed next, on September 13, the Nasdaq 100 went 100% no bid, which means 100% of the stocks declined on that day with zero advancers. This unusual situation happened only 13 times since 1996, with the median stock 12 months later gaining 21%. However, when the Nasdaq 100 drawdown was already 25% or more, similarly to this present decline, the median return of the index was up 64%. Also, since 1962, when we had midterm elections, indexes on average were down 19%. But right after, 12, 18 months later, indexes on average were up 31.6% after the midterm elections. So although past performance is not a guarantee for future performance, we should be opportunistic looking for buying opportunities during these times. Most of the money ever to be made took place during bear markets. This is the worst opening of a year in the past 50 years. And it is also the fourth worst opening of a year in the past 100 years. The only other times it was worse than it is right now was during the Great Depression, World War II, the Vietnam War, and here we are this year. So how can we not look 12 to 18 months into the future. In particular, because we know that an average bear market lasts about 12 to 18 months. We are way into that bear market. We also know that the average decline of a bear market is 33%. Unfortunately, bear markets happen every five to seven years. Since 1956, we had 10 bear markets. Since World War II, we had 12 bear markets. In the past 140 years, we had 19 bear markets, but we always recovered. Therefore, it is my view that although the reasons for this bear market are different than any other time, the action in the marketplace is not much different. We also have pockets of strength in the US economy. For example, since the last global financial crisis in 2009, total accumulated net worth of all individuals living in the US is up from 70 trillion to 140 trillion. Savings rates, although are down by about $660 billion, are still at $1.4 trillion. Average liquidity is 2.2 trillion more than pre-COVID time. The unemployment rate is at 3.5%. And non-farm job creation is still a positive. In July, the US economy created 537,000 jobs. A month later, the US economy created 315,000 jobs. And just last week, the US economy created 263,000 jobs. I will also say that in our view, the Fed put is still in play. That is a potential pivot from quantitative tightening, whereby the Federal Reserve is raising rates and selling $95 billion worth of treasury bonds every month to quantitative easing. And why am I saying that? Because everything the Federal Reserve is telling us, in my view, we should take with a grain of salt. They already changed direction so many times. For example, in the beginning of the year, they told us that inflation is transitory, only to find out that it is permanent. They also told us other things that turned out to be not true. For example, they told us that Fed fund rates this year will peak at 3.4%, only for us to find out that now the trajectory is 4.4% for this year and 4.6% next year. They also told us that unemployment rate this year will peak at 3.7%, which is not the case any longer because now they are talking about 3.8% unemployment rate this year, going to 4.4% for the next two years. 
which means the US economy is on track to lose two plus million jobs in the next few years. So if the Federal Reserve does not have the credibility they used to have, we cannot rely on their summary of economic projections. Therefore, it is our view that a pivot in quantitative tightening is very much possible next year and it doesn't need to come in the form of interest rate cut. All that needs to happen is for interest rates not to go up anymore or for interest rates to go up at a decelerated rate. And alternatively, the Federal Reserve's using what they call Operation Twist, where they, for example, sell short-term treasury bonds in order to buy long-term treasury bonds to reduce interest rates. Or lastly, to open up the discount window, allowing banks to borrow money and have access to liquidity, which means all of the above can be a formula of a Fed put causing interest rates in the end to go down and for stock markets and the economy to rip. So let me conclude what I believe is one of the better buying opportunities that I've seen since the global financial collapse in 2009. We are living through the fourth industrial revolution in technology. We are living through three mega cycles in 5G, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality. For example, 5G is only beginning. By 2026, only half of the 5G communications is expected to run on the networks. We also think that companies in this space can potentially benefit from a 15-fold growth in the size of the US Internet of Things market relative to 2019 by 2030. And companies in the area of smart cities where drones deliver packages in the last mile to your doorstep can grow top line revenues 24 times by 2030. The opportunities are astonishing for the future. And we will not, in my view, have a better opportunity to try and gradually pick up investments in these areas than during this time of the market rout. And in the bond market that is experiencing one of the worst bear markets in the past 100 years, we are now able to pick up bonds that were issued at 100 cents on the dollar with pristine credit at 80 cents on the dollar or so, which means these bonds will mature, in our view, at 100 cents on the dollar with higher cash returns on an annual basis. Therefore, I could not be more opportunistic and more excited about the future. And I also wanted to take this opportunity again to wish us all happy and healthy new year. Good luck to all and thank you very much. The rapid rise in inflation has resulted in a tectonic shift in the way companies operate. The market rotation from story stocks to value companies has occurred because the Federal Reserve's monetary policy is yanking investors back from the risk curve. The rapid rise in prices has become persistent for an array of different reasons. Because many of those factors are more macroeconomic in nature, companies have limited avenues to combat inflation. But there is one driver, however, that companies can augment their business operations to mitigate the impact. Take the labor market, for example. The tight labor market has been a major contributing factor to the stickiness of inflation this year. A labor market is said to be tight when vacant jobs are plentiful and available workers are actually scarce. In the US, in August, there were 10.1 million job openings, and there's only a pool of 6 million workers to fill them. Said another way, there are around two job openings for every one person available to work. This creates tremendous wage bargaining power for workers. Employers in turn increase the prices of their products and services to account for the higher wages they have to pay. Prices spiral higher and higher and in turn result in persistent inflation. Fortunately, not every company needs to approach employment from this rudimentary level. Amazon, for example, is a company that is uniquely poised to thrive in a tight labor market. The research and development they have put into robotic automation will offset the effects of a tight labor market. Their put wall, for example, is an array of cubicles the warehouse workers fill up with customer orders. A robotic version of the put wall can fulfill the same pace of orders, but with one third the need of employees. With this type of efficiency, companies can not only absorb a persistent rise in cost, but it will propel them to automate. Amazon offers these tools to other companies as well through their Amazon Web Services, or AWS, business unit. Productizing these software tools has become quite the profitable business. How big is AWS, you might ask? If they were a standalone company, 
they would be one of the largest in the world with revenues exceeding $82 billion. It's forecast that AWS will account for 15% of the company's top line revenue, but it will account for greater than 100% of the bottom line profit. Their cloud business is growing on a consistent annualized basis at 30% irrespective of macroeconomic factors. Amazon has several other profitable business units operating inside the company, including advertising, which is generating revenue of $38 billion per year on its own. If AWS and the advertising unit generate $45 billion in operating profit this year, we can give these businesses a valuation of 25 times earnings, and that will give us a valuation of $1.1 trillion. This is also the current market cap of Amazon. So what does this mean for your investment? It means you get all of the other businesses Amazon is involved in for free. This includes the e-commerce site, Prime, and even Whole Foods. It's said that fortunes are made in the down market and collected in the up market. And so it's these types of companies that are growing at a faster rate than inflation and selling at a substantial discount that we are after right now. This is because we know that each time the NASDAQ has fallen into a bear market, its average one year move has been up 13%. And it's this forward looking strategy that we're following to take advantage of a market deeply affected by persistent inflation. Over the past several months, the Federal Reserve, led by Chairman Jerome Powell, has steadily increased the federal funds rate in an attempt to slow down the economy and bring inflation under control. Normally, the Federal Reserve will attempt to orchestrate what is referred to as a soft landing between raising interest rates too quickly and slowing the economy too rapidly. With recent inflation numbers coming in at 40-year highs, the Fed has remained aggressive with their interest rate increases. These increases have created one of the worst bond markets we've experienced in the past 100 years. In addition, rising interest rates have created an inversion in the yield curve. Simply stated, an inversion occurs when yields on shorter-term treasuries, like the two-year, yield a higher rate of return than longer duration bonds, particularly the 10-year. These inversions are significant in that five of the last six inversions have led to a recession, making it our most reliable indicator. Although the Federal Reserve has laid out a plan to increase the Fed funds rate by 75 basis points, followed by an additional 50 basis points in their next two meetings, we will continue to follow their narrative for any hint at easing those future increases. In the meantime, this condition in the bond markets has created some favorable buying opportunities. We are finding and taking advantage of opportunities to bid on high quality debt instruments at a discount to the issue price of 15 to 25 cents on the dollar. Our home office staff at our Woodland Hills location for Tamar Securities, along with its affiliates, 911 Financial Services and Firefighters United, will continue to look for and take advantage of these unique buying opportunities. Please remember that anything we discuss during this video is only for your education. As your situation is unique, we also want to urge you to talk to and work with your financial advisor prior to investing, and in particular, prior to investing in anything we discuss during this video. As a reminder, investing involves risk and possible loss of principal capital. Lastly, past performance is no guarantee of future returns.